you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalms 92. Psalms 92, verse 13. Um, if you want to take out a, a paper and a notebook, get on your phone, take some notes, really encourage you to do that today. Um, I'm going to be sharing, this is going to be the final message I'm going to be sharing in this Planted series, and, and I've really enjoyed teaching it to you. I know I've stepped on some of y'all's toes a little bit over the last several weeks, um, and it's, it's my um, desire for you to really understand really what the church is all about. What, what we're all about, what we're supposed to be about. And the church is not Amarillo Fellowship, it's us. We are actually all the church. And it's important that we understand how God is, wants to place us in community, that he wants us to, to get around other followers of Jesus Christ, that he wants us to become planted in the house of God. So in, in three weeks, we're going to be celebrating 20 years as a church. And yeah, amen. So I, I want to encourage you, in fact, to make plans on attending on September 17th. We're going to be talking a little bit about kind of where we've come from. Some of you may not know all the story. Um, talk about where we're at and where we're going. And so I want to encourage you to plan on making plans to be there because it's, it really has been an incredible journey. Um, and, and when I was thinking about it this week, I was thinking about when we started. We started by setting up in a school. And we would go in on Sunday mornings real early and we would set up a sound system, set up a projector, set up all kinds of different things. And, and it, the church just kind of began to grow and it was a lot of fun. We, we probably had people serving uh, on the worship team or in different areas that I don't even know if they were saved yet, to be quite honest with you. It was just, it was a real fun adventure. I remember there was this one guy who was in charge of the, the slides and we used to use PowerPoint, if you're familiar with that. And we would put the, the words up on the screen so we could worship in my notes. And I remember a couple of times he would get lost in the middle of worship and he would just keep toggling through all of the words and he was on the next song and keep toggling, kept toggling and I'm up on the front row praying, God, just let him have a heart attack and die so he at least stops moving the slides. You know, it was, it was kind of one of those things that it really, really what has been an incredible journey to watch the way God has developed people, the way he's developed me, the way he's developed a lot of leaders in this church. And, and as I think back on it, it really was filled with a lot of good times and a lot of challenging times. In fact, it kind of reminds me of the book by Charles Dickens, The, the Tale of Two Cities, that, that it was the best of times and it was the worst of times because we shared a lot of joys, a lot of amazing things happened, but we also shed a lot of tears. We had a lot of amazing things happen that we stood back and went, God, wow, that's amazing. And then, then we faced some disappointments. And, and so I think one of the most challenging things for Anybody that's involved in like planning a church, leading a church, or any organization really is to manage your expectations. And I think it really is honestly a good rule for all of us just in our life in general is to learn how to manage our expectations. Because if we don't learn how to manage our expectations properly with people, we'll be disappointed with people and things literally all the time. Because I've noticed that God doesn't always work on my timetable. God doesn't always do the things that I would want him to do. And I know now that's a good thing. But if we don't manage our expectations with people, for instance, a lot of times our expectation for ourselves is right down here that we give ourselves a lot of grace and a lot of mercy, but our expectations for other people is way up here. You just gave your life to Christ and you mean you're not a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ yet? You, you just gave your life to Christ and you're not tithing 10% yet. And we go on and on putting expectations on people. And so we really have to learn how to manage our expectations. Because when we started the church, I wasn't doing it very well. And I just knew that when we started the church, that people were going to literally be lining up outside of the door just waiting to get in. They just couldn't wait till we opened the door. But it wasn't like that. And, and while we, for the most part, we've always had just kind of continual slow growth, the growth hasn't always been at the pace that I wanted. But God always knew it was going to be at the pace that I needed. And so we got to manage our expectations. So I used to think that when, when we get this or when this happens, then, man, things are just going to take off and we're going to start growing like crazy, right? Well, what I finally began to understand, because God began to speak to my heart about this, is that it isn't always about what's out there. It's all about what's already in here. And, and what he was saying to me is that if I wanted to go higher as a pastor and, and lead a larger church and lead a larger organization, which, by the way, we're, we're not concerned about numbers for numbers' sakes that we can be impressive to people in our city. The reason why we're concerned about numbers is because every number has a name and every name has a story and every story matters to God. That's why we're concerned about numbers. 
But God was saying, if I, if I wanted to go higher, then I had to go deeper. And, and it's the same for every one of us, that if we want to go higher and, and accomplish the purpose, the plan, and the design that God has for our life, if we want to do those things that we know maybe inside of our heart that's written from eternity past that God has for us, if we're going to go higher, we have to go deeper. Because it really is depth that creates the ability to go higher. So that's why we've been looking at this verse in Psalms 92, verse 13. And it says this, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. That's what God's heart and desire is for each and every one of us, is that our lives are fresh and flourishing. What does that look like? It looks like joy in your life. It looks like joy in your life. You know, I, I like to say this all the time because I think it kind of messes with people a little bit, but we are incredibly happy with people having a scowl on their face. If, the, if you walk up to somebody and they're like this, you're totally fine with that. But if they're smiling like this, you're like, okay, what on earth is wrong with that person? But in reality, as followers of Jesus Christ, our lives should be fresh and flourishing. Not because we've got it perfect and everything's always all together, but because the moment we notice that it's not, we adjust our thinking going, look, I'm miss missing some stuff. Let me get back and let my life become fresh and flourishing today. Because a lot of Christians aren't fr fr fresh and flourishing. Easy for me to say. And a lot of times they don't understand why some of the promises of God aren't showing up in their life. Because I talk about God's desire to bless you, that God wants to do good towards you, that the song we're singing this morning about God being good can't be anything else. And we're going, well, if he's so good, then why is this happening? And sometimes we don't understand things like Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, why that's not happening in our life, where Paul writes to us, and he says this, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, watch this, above all that we ask, watch this, or think Think about it. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is working within us. We, we, we don't know why sometimes the exceedingly abundant, all that we can ask or think, life. Why isn't that showing up in my life? Why, why isn't that happening? Well, I can't explain all of it, but I can tell you one reason why I believe is because you're not planted. You're, you're not planted in the house of God. Because when you choose not to be planted in the house of God, what you basically choose is to become a bonsai Christian. And we've been talking about this and looking at it over the last several weeks. I want to review again because a bonsai tree like this is something that is put into an environment that is confined. It, it, it limits literally the potential of the seed. And because of that, it's not fruitful. So why is that? Well, because bonsai Christians, number one, determine the shape of their own pot. Right. They're the one that goes ahead and decides, oh, I don't want to get planted out in the ground where I can really have some roots go down. I want to get in a pot that I can kind of move my life around and adjust it like I see. I can, th they determine the shape of their pot, and the reason why they do is because self remains the center of their world, not God. I don't know what Christianity means to you because a lot of times we can think I'm American so I'm a Christian. No, Christianity is you surrendering your life to Jesus Christ for him to be your savior, meaning he paid for your sin, but also for him to be your Lord, meaning he is in charge of your life. So you read the word to understand what he wants you to do. It's, it's easy for all of us to get self on the throne of our life. Every one of us have to constantly recognize, I am making choices that I think are about me instead of choices that are about God. So again, self is on the throne of their life, not God. So the second thing is they require constant maintenance. Be, because the soil is shallow, they need constant attention. They need constant watering. They need a daily fix-up. Whether that's somebody that is coming in and talking to them or they need a daily fix-up of, oh, I'm about, my life's about ready to fall apart. Oh, God, thank you. Oh, my life's about ready to fall apart. They constantly need a daily fix-up. And so the final reason is they fail to reach maturity. They never fully mature. So it begs the question, why would anyone want to be a bonsai Christian? Why, why would anyone 
choose to not have a deeply rooted life? Why would, why would anyone choose to be a bonsai Christian? Well, I don't think for the most part, people don't choose to live fruitlessness in their lives. They don't choose to have fruitlessness happening in their lives. I think the problem is, is they just don't understand some foundational things. And because they don't understand some foundational things, it keeps producing the wrong fruit in their life. Because you see, the root issue really for all of us as followers of Jesus Christ is really understanding how perfectly God loves us. Not to intellectually understand that as a fact, but to literally experience and know, I know God loves me. I know that God loves me in my best moments. You know that, right? Do you believe that God loves you in your worst moments? Do you believe that God is still for you in the moments when you blew it, when you told him a thousand times, God will never do that again? He does. He never changes. That's how good our God is. See, because when we look at verse 20 and we understand that, that above life that we're talking about, you have to back up one verse to really understand what's setting this verse up. Verse 19 says this, to know, by the way, that word is the Greek word gnosko, and it means to know experientially, to know intimately. To, to know on this ongoing basis. It's the word Paul used at the end of his life. Greatest Christian that ever lived and is still saying, oh, that I might know him. He, he wanted to, to know more intimately the revelation of God. Here's what it says. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all of the fullness of God. Yeah. So the problem is a lot of times they just don't understand that God loves them. That God is actually for you. They want the height. They want the exceedingly abundantly above all and more than life. That's what they want. But they fail to recognize that because they have no depth, a deep understanding of God's love, God can't give them the height. He can't. Because if they have great height without the depth, when the storms of life come, they'll fall with a great crash. See, I believe that many of you, God's called you for these incredible purposes to maybe manage and lead people, to run companies, to be in large ministries, to run large areas of ministry. But if you don't have the depth without the character, when the storm comes, you'll you'll fall. And I I hate to say it, but we've seen it happen a lot in the news lately of, of pastors that didn't have the depth, ministers that didn't have the depth, people that didn't have the depth. But God gave them the height for whatever reason, and it was just too much for them. See, because God wants us to walk in the more than life. Let me say that again. God wants us, all of us, to walk in the more than life. But sometimes he actually protects us from what could easily damage us, what could easily destroy us. And the, the great news today is, which, by the way, whenever I'm talking about the gospel, it is the good news. The great news is today is no matter what choices you have made in the past, you can make different choices today. If you've been making wrong choices, you can rework your brain and begin to make the right choices. So today, you can either be a bonsai Christian or you can make a decision that I'm going to become a planted Christian. Well, what does a planted Christian look like? And again, we're reviewing. A planted Christian is someone who commits to a deeply rooted life. They're, they're not just here today and gone tomorrow. They, they let their roots go down. See, I think that when we move from church to church, we should never leave a church. We should be going to another church that we feel God's called us because of a ministry that they may have there. But we've got to make a decision. Once we come in and we start looking around and we hang out with some people for a while and we go, you know what, these people are pretty nice. These people are some pretty sweet people here. This is a place where I think I would like to get connected. We've got to get our roots down. We've got to make a choice to let our roots go down deep. When you look at a forest and you see those huge trees, they have roots that go way, way down. They go so far down and they start to spread out that their roots touch other roots. And so their roots get intertwined. So it's not just your strength anymore. It's the strength of those around you. I don't know about you, but I think this is the case for everybody because it's certainly the case for me. I need other people's strength from time to time. There, there have been some times when I'm a little battle weary and I'm, and I'm feeling a little me- mentally fatigued and spiritually fatigued and I've got people around me that their strength begins to come in and they begin to wrap their arms around me and going, Pastor Richie, you got this, man. You're a mighty man of God. And it's not because I'm, I'm not a mighty man of God because I always do things perfectly. It's the purpose and destiny that God has in my life. So I can say this to every one of you today. You're a mighty man and a mighty woman of God. Let me say it again, because I really mean it. You're a mighty man and a mighty woman of God. That's the purpose and plan. 
Some of you, your very first thought was, well, you don't know what I said last night. You don't know what I did last night. You don't know what I did in my past, Pastor Richie. You don't know that matters. If you become a follower of Jesus Christ, it's all under the blood. I love the fact that God says he'll remember our sin no more, that he takes our sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west, and chooses to remember it no more. You're a mighty man of God. Some of you men need to hear that. You're a mighty woman of God. Some of you woman, women need to hear that. And what God is always saying to us, to all of us is, I've got so much fruit, more fruitfulness for you. I want your life to be incredibly fruitful. And I'm, I'm not talking just about spiritual fruit, fruit, though that's the most important. But all areas of your life, God wants you to be fruitful. But listen, if you're up and out, up and out all the time, you're running from friendships, you're running from relationships, you're running from churches all the time. Years ago, Pastor Jimmy Evans used to preach against the spirit of divorce in America. And, and I, I love that, but I think that spirit of divorce has translated now into relationships just as much. The moment there's a problem, we're up and out, up and out. We're up and out of marriages, we're up and out of friendships, we're up and out of relationships. Just because it got a little challenging and a little difficult. Listen, you walk through some difficult times with some friends and neighbors, you're, they're going to become lifelong friends because you battle together. You walk through some stuff together. So we can't be up and out. Listen, you've you got to commit to a deeply rooted life because if you don't, you're not going to see the exponential growth that God actually has for your life. God has an amazing plan for your life. So a planted Christian is someone who commits to a deeply rooted life. The second thing is a planted Christian adds value to the orchard. They, they add value. Here's the question again. Is the church here for you or are you here for the church? Listen, if you've been beat up by life, you've been broken, damaged, some things have really gone wrong, been abused, whatever it might be, the church is here for you. We really are. We're going to help you. We're going to bandage you up. We're going to teach you the word of God. We're going to help you forgive some people. We're going to help you to understand the word of God so maybe you don't get yourself in the same situations again. We're even going to kick the devil out of your life, by the way. We're, we're here for you. But listen, at some point, somewhere along the way, you need to get out of the hospital bed. You do. You need to get out of the hospital bed and get, stand up and say, you know what? I'm actually here for someone else. Because even some of the things that I've walked through, God can use me to impact and change someone else's life. Well, I'm here for someone else. So the question is, are you planted? I mean, it, it literally is just a decision that you make. Have you decided to let your roots go down really deep where surface stuff doesn't affect you any longer? Where what somebody may have said doesn't affect you any longer? We, we, we let people in control of our lives all the time. We do. Somebody says something wrong and we leave a church. We let, somebody says something wrong, we leave a relationship. We've got to make a decision to not let the surface stuff affect us anymore. Listen, are you here to get something or are you here to add something? Right. You can say amen or oh me, whichever one fits today. <laughs> do, do you show up early to see maybe what needs to happen? Do you, do you go to the open house on September 10th? Are you making plans to do that because you want to find out what this church is all about and maybe a way that you can get plugged in and you can get involved? Do, do you, have you decided, man, I'm going to get in a small group even though I'm a little bit uncomfortable because I've got some life experiences that I know somebody needs and somebody else has some life experiences that I need. So do, are, you, are you planning that? Well, you may be asking, well, how do I get motivated enough to do that? How do you, the only way that I believe that you can do it is if you get a revelation of how much and how perfectly God loves you. If you begin to understand what he's done for you, what he did when he died and saved your soul, the, the verse that Pam was reading from Isaiah, how God, Jesus was beaten for us, how for our, for our healing, all the things that he did that we might be righteous. Listen, he wants to see fruitfulness in your life. He's for you today. So we have to decide, and you're going to have to make a choice. I'm not going to be a bonsai Christian. I'm, I'm not going to be this where everything is all about me. How will I know? Again, am I a planted Christian? Have I decided to let my roots go down deep? Am I adding value to the orchard, to the church? Am I bringing value to the house of God? So if God were to give you one request this morning that he would grant, what would you ask for? Would you ask for wealth? Would you ask for health? Would you ask for a job, maybe a new job, better job? Would you ask for a raise? Would you ask for the death of an enemy? 
kind of an old covenant thing, but they did ask for it back then. I think the psalmist David really understood this thing that I'm talking about. Because here's what he said in Psalms 27, verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Man, I think David understood that if he gets his roots down, listen, the enemy might attack and the enemy will attack, but he's not going to be able to have victory over him because his roots go down really deep. And, and by the way, it doesn't take very long to get out of the habit of consistently showing up for church. It really, it happens about like that. I miss one time, well, I, I need to miss today because I'm kind of thinking I sort of might have a headache. And the next week gets a little easier. The next week gets a little easier. In fact, I run into people all the time that used to be faithful to the house of God. And, and I could tell a lot of times when I go up and I start talking to them, they, I could tell they're kind of embarrassed. Which, by the way, I, I'm never mad at anybody that leaves the church or does whatever. I, I promise I'm not. I won't ever be mad at you if you don't do what I ask you to do. I, I used to. I used to feel like my whole self-worth was based on if I preached something to you and you didn't do it the next week, then something was wrong with me. But I, I won't. But I, but I run into them all the time, and, and they often start telling me, without me even asking, why they haven't been in church. And, and a lot of times it's because they took this job that's consuming them. Um, and and um, I, I would say this, you know, growing up, my parents didn't allow us to work on Sundays. We couldn't take a job if we had to work on Sundays. I know that, again, that's old-fashioned. But it's the way I was raised. So normally it's work-related or, or it's related because of some kind of sport. Whether it's the Cowboys are going to be playing that day on TV and they need to kind of emotionally prepare themselves all morning for the game that's about ready to take place. Or sometimes club ball. Things start pulling them away. And, and what they're telling me, and inadvertently they're telling me that, it's, that they will work their butt off for, for possibly more money than they'll ever need. And they'll be involved in sports that are fun and enjoyable, but have no eternal value. Right. All for this, all at the same time forsaking being planted. Right. And not only will they forsake being planted, but they'll actually teach others right. to be planted. Because people are more watching more what we do than what we say. Right. I think it was Emerson that said, what you are, shout so loudly in my ears that I can't hear what you say. Right. And... When I talk to those people, a lot of times they're wondering why they aren't having breakthrough in their lives, why they feel cold and disconnected from God, why they're not really walking in the more than life that God has for them that I keep talking about. And, and many of them are dealing with depression and fear and thinking that's normal because they've done it for so long that this is just the norm. They, they can't figure out why. Why does my life not have any purpose or meaning? And they try to band-aid it by Net, Netflixing, Netflixing, binge watching things on Netflix, or they get involved in drugs, or they get involved in alcohol, they get involved in sexual promiscuous relationships, they, they seek after friendships or something to satisfy that thing that's missing in their life, and, and trying to fill the void in their life. But God says, listen, I've got some things for you. I've got some things that I, I want you to do. I've got plans for your life that are, that are bigger than what you can imagine or what you can dream. Right. Your purpose and destiny is bigger than what you can imagine or dream. But you have to choose. You have to choose. I'm either going to be a bonsai Christian or I'm going to be someone who is planted in the house of God, that I'm fresh and flourishing, that the heart of God is, is my heartbeat. But you're going to have to accept the fact that you've got to be here for something that's bigger than you. That we're here for the kingdom. We're here for our king. We're not here for just what I can get out of it. So I want to wind up this series today by giving you just, by the way, I'm finally beginning my message today. Um, nervous laughter. So let me, let me wind up this series by giving you one more point about being a planted Christian. And again, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but here we go. All right. Planted Christians are, number one, deeply rooted Christians. Number two, they add value to the orchard. And finally, they allow the required pruning. They allow the required pruning. You know, I, I hear this from time to time. People will say, you know what, I really don't like our pastors or I don't like people that are in leadership because they're making decisions that are making people 
angry, that people are getting angry with some of their decisions. And, and of course, we can all make bad decisions, but sometimes we just don't understand the reasoning behind the decisions that are being made. We don't fully understand all the things that are going on. And because I know how the devil works, which, by the way, he's a thief who's come to steal, kill, and destroy, he'll make an accusation against me. He'll make an accusation against leaders in this church or someone that's trying to help you. And he'll begin to whisper into your ear things like, if they really cared about people, they wouldn't fill in the blank. Or if they really cared about you, they would fill in the blank. You see, the devil's plan is to get you angry or frustrated with me, to get you angry or frustrated with the church leadership, or maybe even someone who is actually just trying to help you. He, he wants you to be angry and frustrated with them, because if he can get you at odds with me, with leaders, other people in the church, you won't go through the necessary pruning that all of us need in our lives. Every one of us need pruning. Do, do you know that a fruitful or a productive tree is, is pruned about every year or pretty close to every year? In fact, this is how Jesus actually put it in context for us. He said in John 15, he cuts off every branch in me, non-planted Christians, that bears no fruit, but every branch that does bear fruit, he what? He prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. See, Watch your toes because I'm about ready to step on them, all right? I'm doing it because I love you. I'm Richie Brown. I'm your friend here today. But listen, when was the last time someone pruned you and you didn't run away? When is the last time someone pruned you and you didn't carry an offense about them pruning you? Now, I want to share this related to us pruning people. It's not our responsibility to go around and fault find and prune everybody we come in contact with, all right? So if you think I'm giving you permission to do that, let me just stop you right now, all right? It's, again, one of the reasons why we do small groups. It's the, one of the reasons why you need some close relationships. You need to remove some barriers. You need to open some door. You need to forgive some people. You need to get past being offended sometimes with some people so that you can get some people that can get up close enough to you that you know love you. You know that they love you, that they can speak into your life, and that they know how to speak into your life, that we always do it with love. Because you remember, it's the word of God says that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's not your theological thumping over the head that leads them to repentance, all right? It's God's kindness. But when you get people, allow people to get inside, they can prune you. I need pruning every day. You need pruning every day. There isn't ever a time when you and I don't need some pruning to take place in our life. Still don't believe me? I want to do a little illustration today. All of us at certain times in our lives have dead branches in our life. And honestly, this is about what it looks like. It really does. We have, we have some bad habits. We've got negative words. We've got a negative attitude. We've got anger issues. And you know what? Everyone else can see it but us. We're the only ones that can't see it. We need help removing it. We do. Think, okay, think about it just a second because I know you don't have anything, all right? But you do have some people in your life that you see this all the time. I mean, one little small thing goes wrong and they fly off the handle. You know, they're, they're constantly depressed. They're constantly fearful. They're constantly worried. And if, you, if they would let you in, you could literally go up and say, hey, let me just take care of that for you. Let me help you get rid of that thing in your life. This happens to me all the time. Again, there isn't ever a time when some old branches don't need to come off of us. It happens all the time. There's never a time when pain is not a part of the process. You remember the old saying, no pain, no gain? It is so true. We want to avoid pain. Have you ever seen a prune tree? It, when, when, when you prune a branch, and if you look real closely to it, the, the sap starts to come out. It almost looks like it's crying. Yeah. It, it does. And because what is happening is the sap is coming out of the tree almost as tears. And it's those tears that actually create the seal that keeps the joint from getting infected. There's pain involved in the process. And, and the problem is that most of us don't sell prune. We don't, we be, because we don't like the pain that pruning brings. We, we don't sell prune. Listen, I don't, I, 
we don't sell prune because, listen, we have a tendency to run away or push away people that God is actually bringing into our lives to prune us. By the way, you're here today not on accident. You may think, well, I just decided to show up. I'm telling you, God had an appointment for you today for, you, for me to be able to speak to you today about some stuff. And there's not ever a time when they're not, God's not bringing people into our lives to prune us, but we run from it all the time. They're trying to help us just get that stupid stick out of our head. And God has called me as your pastor. He's called the leadership of this church. He's called other people, small group leaders of this local body here at Amarillo Fellowship to get everyone, every tree in the garden as healthy as it possibly can be. To help you be as healthy as you can be so that the fruit of, of our lives can be evident for a community that is running to you and I and say, can someone please feed me? Can, can someone care about me? Can someone please help me with the ditch that I'm in, that we love them so much we can go, let me help you out of that. Because the fruitfulness that's happening in our lives. I don't like pruning. I, I don't like when it's done to me. I don't like doing it to others. But it has to be a part of my life. It, it's got to be a part of your life. We all need people in our lives that love us enough to say, listen, that attitude has got to go. The, Hey, don't call or text on Sunday morning and say you can't make it. Ouch. Hey, your area's falling behind. We need to get a little bit better. Hey, we need to put a smile on our face. Listen, we're leaving our weak problems at the door. When we come in here, we're a community dedicated to spreading the love and hope of Jesus Christ. And we're bigger than the problem that we faced last week. We need some people that are willing to say that to us. Again, for some of you, you're like, man, oh. I'm not letting anybody like that. Others are going, thank you, Pastor Richie. You finally gave me permission to do it. Yeah. Listen, it's through relationships. It's through connection. So we have to allow the required pruning because pruning stimulates new buds. Yeah. It actually controls growth of the tree. Yeah. It removes dead branches and it creates strength in the plant. Not, no pruning, no strength for the future. Right. Right. And I love the fact that God wants his church to be like a healthy fruit market. He does where, because I've been in churches that they weren't a healthy fruit market. I mean, have you ever been into a, a fruit market where it was like this? You go there and the fruit's been there a long time. There's gnats flying around all of it. It's kind of old and rotting. Unfortunately, that's what a lot of churches become like. And we don't want to be that. We're, we're going to create fresh fruit, the, the more than life that God wants. How do we do that? We have to have the pruning that's required to bring the fruit in its season. We have to be willing to be pruned. So I want to encourage you today. Let's be a planted people. Let's make a decision. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my roots to go down deep. Here, here's my view on this. If you're in town and you're not sick, you're in church. If you're in town and you're not sick, you're at small group. Now, listen, for some of you are going, man, I come once every six weeks. Maybe for you, it's you're going to start showing up once a month. Whatever your next step is, you're figuring out how to become more planted. So I want to encourage you today, let's be a planted people. Why is that so important? Because environments shape destinies. If you want to know what your destiny is like, look at the environment that you're putting yourself in right now. Even more importantly, God's word tells us to. In fact, here's what the writer of Hebrews says. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. In other words, we need to show up. Well, how much are you talking showing up? Well, I think we need to go back to the early church because the early church is the church that turned the world upside down. Here's what it says in Acts 2. Every day. Ooh, say with me, every day. Every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts, big church, and they broke bread in their homes and ate together, small groups, with glad and sincere hearts. They did it every day because environments shape destinies. I've said this throughout the series. I want to say it one last time. I am responsible to you. But I'm not responsible for you. You get to decide what you're going to do. But you don't get to choose the results of what it is that you decide to do. And if we choose wrong, we're going to keep reaping the wrong things. If we start choosing right, we're going to reap the right things. And I think if this bonsai tree could speak to us today. Guys, would you put that picture up on the thing, screen again? Same seed, different environment again. I, I think it would say, let's, don't be a bonsai. Don't be a bonsai Christian. Look, I know, I know that I look cute. I know it's easy. It's flexible. Christianity is real easy for you. But the bonsai would say to us, I can never become that. 
I can never become the thing that I was designed and destined to become. The thing that I was actually created to be. And, and we can sing songs like, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but we can be enslaved by the shallowness of the soil that we've choos- chosen to be planted in, that we find ourselves in. So we need to choose to be planted Christians. Why? Again, our, our scripture verse, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age and they shall be fresh and flourishing. I want you to know this is the life that God has for and wants for each and every one of you. But it only happens when we get planted. This morning as I was winding up my message, kind of preparing for the day, I remember that I would received a text from a gentleman earlier this week. And I want to close by reading this to you to help us understand how there's a lot of things that are happening in our life that we don't really understand. It's only when we get the culmination of everything that we really understand it says, a pastor asked an old farmer decked out in his bib overalls to say grace for the morning, men's morning breakfast. He started off by saying, Lord, I hate buttermilk. The farmer began. The pastor opened one eye and glanced at the farmer and wondered where on earth is he going. The farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued, and Lord, you know I don't care for raw white flour. The pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room and saw that he wasn't the only one that was feeling uncomfortable. Then the farmer added, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up and we don't like and things get hard and we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you are done mixing. It will probably be even better than the biscuits. Amen. Amen. And I know we've all had some things in our life that have negatively affected us. But I'm telling you, sometimes our misery actually becomes our ministry. That you walk through something that was so difficult, you never thought you'd make it through it. And you make it through it, and now suddenly your life is changed, and you can begin to talk to people that are walking through the same thing. But it only happens as we're planted. You see why the enemy wants to uproot us so much? We've got to make a decision to get planted. I'm going to invite you to stand up, if you would. I'm going to ask you, if you would, right there in your seat, just bow your head and close your eyes for just a second. I'm, I'm going to be done in just a few minutes. But I want to pray one more time over you that you'd make a decision to get planted. If you've not yet done that, you haven't made a decision to get planted, I'm, I want to pray that you would make a choice today. Say, I want to be planted in the house of God. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Lord, I pray over us once again, God, and ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. Father, just to speak to our hearts through your word. God, I know we wrestle through even this legalistic thing about being in the house of God. And Lord, I pray that we would set all of that aside and and do what we can to take our next step in being planted in the house of God. Lord, that we would recognize there's a call, a destiny, and a purpose on our life. There's fruitfulness that you want to see. Lord, that not only helps us and is wonderful for us, but God, it, it feeds and helps other people that you placed in our life, our family, friends, and coworkers. And so, God, help us to make that choice, to take our next step, to say, I'm going to get planted in the house of the Lord because I want my life to be fresh and flourishing in everything that I do. So, God, I thank you that even right now you're speaking to people's hearts and they're making a decision. From this day forward, it's the first day of the rest of their life, they're going to get planted in the house of God.